All right. So it is noon. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, guys, everybody, to our healthy living in a growing environment. Uh, Tina McIntyre and I will be teaching today. We're with UFI Physics Extension Seminole County. Uh, for the um, options that you have for communicating us today, uh, mostly we would prefer that you use the Q&A box. So if you have questions, type them into the Q&A uh, box and we will get to them as we have time. Uh, if you'd like to be unmuted to ask a question, you can raise a hand and as we have time, we'll unmute you and let you ask that question. But again, uh, we'd prefer it go into the Q&A box. Finally, the chat box has been disabled just to filter all our questions into that one area for easier uh, tracking. Next, uh, we will be sending out a survey to the participants of this um, webinar today. So please fill out the survey and you will be eligible for some of the giveaways this weekend. Uh, and we'll send you guys a different follow-up survey in three to six months. So keep an eye out for that as well. We'll just be surveying to see today what you learned. Uh, and the next time we send you that survey in three to six months, it'll see if you've actually implemented any of the things that we've uh, taught you. So keep an eye out for both of those. And now we're gonna get started with our healthy living in a growing environment presentation. So this is part of our Grow Your Healthy Florida Lifestyle series, which is taking place on Tuesdays from April 6th to 27th. So we have today's presentation, and then we'll also be doing another presentation next Tuesday, and then we'll be done. Um, the series is to teach you about different ways that you can improve your health here in Central Florida, uh, teaching it, for our first week and our last week, we'll be joined by Sharon Gam, who is here today as well. Uh, she is our worksite wellness and fitness coach for Seminole County government and a wealth of knowledge on everything fitness and uh, eating healthy here in Seminole County. Uh, also, you have me, Katie McCormick. I'm the residential horticulture agent and master gardener volunteer coordinator here in Seminole County. So I deal with residential questions on gardening, uh, bugs, um, plant identification, as well as train our master gardener volunteers. Uh, next, we've got Tina McIntyre, who is with us today as well. Uh, Tina is our Florida Friendly Landscaping agent and deals with a lot of Florida Friendly Landscaping here in the county, as well as working with our homeowners associations and with our fertilizer ordinance here in the county. And finally, we've got Morgan Pinkerton, who is our sustainable agriculture and food systems agent here in Seminole County. She worked with our farms, as well as the food systems found in Seminole County. And she taught our last session on what is our food system here in Seminole. So you might be wondering a little bit, what is Extension? Tina, Morgan, and I are all part of the Extension office here in Seminole County. And Extension is actually a partnership between federal, state, and local government with the roles of communicating science-based information to the local community and communicating the needs of the community to the scientists. So we bring the information from the University of Florida to our communities to teach them what are the best practices, what is the newest research on gardening or wellness or food systems. Uh, and we also bring the needs of the community, what you guys are looking for more information on that we may not have information on uh, and bringing that to the scientists to ask, hey, can you research this and tell us more information about it? Or do you have information on it? So for our Healthy Living in a Growing Environment class today, um, we are going to be talking about how nature can enhance your health, uh, covering our natural land ecosystems and trails that are available to you as Seminole County residents. We'll be going over a Florida-friendly landscaping introduction and talking about our nine Florida-friendly landscaping principles. And then we'll be going over incorporating edibles into your landscape uh, for healthier living as well. So first, oops, uh, we want to talk a little bit about how nature can enhance your health, which I think I skipped a slide there. Let's see. Nope. All right. It's always a little bit slow when you're working on somebody else's screen. So how nature can enhance your health. Um, 
when we're talking about just enjoying nature in general and going outside, um, we know that long-term stress can lead to disease in people. If you're stressed out all the time, it can lead to disease. It's the same with plants. If your plant is stressed out all the time due to the situation that it's growing in, it's also going to be more susceptible to pests and diseases. So we're just like really complicated plants. Uh, views of greenery and access to green space, we know create a greater sense of well-being and a connection to your neighborhood and to nature. And green spaces also can enhance mindfulness. They make you slow down and take notice of the area around you. They've been found to have a positive impact on immune responses. So you are better able to fight off disease whenever you're able to enjoy natural areas and green spaces. And they found that people have increased self-discipline whenever they are out and enjoying nature. It's easier to make uh, those good wellness decisions whenever you are calm and in a good place. Exposure to natural surroundings has also been found to have a restorative effect on humans. It's been found to improve cognitive function, so you're able to think better whenever you are able to enjoy the outdoors. It's been found to relieve mental fatigue, contribute to higher productivity, and also increase creativity. So being outdoors has just been found to be good for you. Being able to enjoy the outdoors uh, makes you feel better physically and mentally. And finally, if you're actually outdoors and cultivating the land, that also has health benefits. So it's good for your health to be outdoors and cultivating because you're working and moving your whole body. I don't know about you, but whenever I have to weed a flower bed, that's a whole lot of bending and pulling and tugging and uh, pruning requires a lot of cutting and moving all parts of your body as you're actually getting out there and doing that work, which can get your heart rate up uh, and also improve your hand strength. So it's good for your physical health. It also reduces stress and can make you feel happier. So you're focusing on a specific task and on living things. Uh, and oftentimes, especially if you're weeding, there's some um, almost immediate gratification or instant gratification as you're cleaning up your garden. Also, there is a healthy bacteria that lives in our soils that has been found to actually reduce anxiety and increase serotonin levels in people when they come into contact with it. So interacting with the natural world around you can uh, introduce you to that bacteria and make you feel a little better just from that. And then finally, if you're outdoors gardening and you do incorporate some edible food into your landscape or edible plants into your landscape, uh, it can help you eat healthier as well because it doesn't get fresher than picking vegetables that morning to cook in your food or picking them a couple minutes before you start cooking your recipe. And having vegetables or herbs available right when you need them makes you more likely to eat them. So if they're available and ready for you to pick outside, are you going to let them go to waste on the plant? Or are you going to harvest them and figure out something to do with them that day? So gardening can also enhance your health on top of just being outdoors and enjoying all the benefits of being outside. And next, uh, part of the basis for this uh, program are Blue Zones and the Mediterranean lifestyle, which takes into consideration having a healthy social circle, uh, having no time urgency, so doing things at your own pace, and making sure that you're eating good food. So a lot of uh, these Blue Zoned areas that they found, uh, which were Sardinia, Italy, Okinawa, Japan, and Loma Linda in the United States have a lot of things in common. Where they all really line up is a focus on the family, not smoking, having a really heavily plant-based diet, uh, constant moderate physical activity, which getting outside, either hiking our natural trails or gardening can definitely introduce you to, social engagement, and legumes, which we'll be talking a little bit about growing beans later on in this presentation to add those to your diet. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, you know, I know it can be challenging to, you know, if you're just getting started to say, I'm going to integrate all these, you know, so starting small and, you know, taking one thing at a time, integrating one thing at a time, um, getting your family and friends on board to, you know, try to work together on one, you know, shared goal can be 
more manageable, you know, because it is, there's a lot of things in our society that um, can be challenging to, to say no to, you know. Um, so just trying to, to take little steps can always be really helpful. Yeah, so thank you for that, Katie. And, you know, in Seminole County, we're the natural choice, as many of you who are employees or master gardeners know. And we just are really privileged to have lots of wilderness areas, trails, parks. So I'm just going to kind of touch on a few. Um, they're typically on these trails. You can do biking, bicycling, you can do, um, you know, rollerblades, skateboards, you can walk, run whatever suits you. And, um, you know, typically there's multiple places that you can start at the trail. So along, um, for example, here, the Riverwalk Trail, which goes along Lake Monroe and downtown Sanford, you know, there's multiple places where you can either park or just kind of pick up that trail. We have the Flagler Trail, which is on the eastern side of the county, which runs from Lake Harney Wilderness Area, which is just beautiful overlooking the St. Johns River and Lake Harney um, runs through kind of uh, over to Side Road 46. And um, I do believe there's a gap there, but um, the trail picks back up in Geneva Wilderness area and cuts through down to Oviedo. So, and again, you know, if you're picking it up in Oviedo, there's a few places to kind of park and catch the trail. Um, and then we have our Cross Seminole Trail, which is the um, pink one here. And this one is quite long, goes kind of parallel to, um, to I-4, and then runs through our Soldiers Creek and Spring Hammock Parks. It's quite nice. And again, there's parking there to be able to pick up the trail. This is a highly urbanized area here too, but the trail is still accessible and runs through some green spaces to be able to get that you know, nature and green submersion that makes us feel so much better and creative. Um, and then kind of run south in through um, down to Winter Park area. And then finally, we have um, here on the left, our Wakaiva tra Trail that runs kind of in the Wakaiva River Basin, uh, again, along I-4, but it's, um, you know, going to be going in through Katie's Landing, which is, again, a, one of our great parks that is right on the Wakaiva River. And so you can, you know, bike and paddle at the, you know, at the same area here. So lots of opportunities to get outside, enjoy these wilderness areas. So you can see additionally to the trails, you can see the natural lands. So these are our wilderness areas where we have hiking available. Um, of course, there's no off-roading or anything like that. We definitely encourage that these are used respectfully and, um, but great for getting outside and just having that quiet time or, you know, active engagement, you know, family time, family play, bring your dog out and, you know, just really enjoy. So Black Hammock Wilderness Area, that's over um, kind of closer to Lake Jessup um, along the, uh, like I mentioned, Lake Harney, but we also have Little Big Econ State Forest. That's a wonderful place. And then even down by UCF, we have the Seminole Ranch Conservation Area. And if you visit these areas, you might see that they've been recently burned. One thing I want to quickly touch on is that fire is really integral to a lot of our Floridian ecosystems. And so that's perfectly normal. Um, you know, it could have been a wildfire, in which case our fire department and um, Florida Forest Service would be handling that. But a lot of the times they're prescribed fires. And so they're actually planned fires to benefit the health of the ecosystem. And of course, that's all um, public notices and, and postings and things like that so that you would be notified. But it's really quite amazing to see an area that has recently been burned and then see it come back to life and witness that and, and really just kind of enjoy that aspect of it. So one thing that might prevent some of you from kind of taking advantage of these natural areas is the, the fear of nature. And so we do have a lot of ingraining in society as to why people might have different feelings or thoughts, sentiments about nature and saying, well, that's just not for me. You know, I'm, I'm scared of snakes or bugs or things like that. And to be able to tap into those green benefits, that green medicine of uh, everything Katie just talked about, you know, we want to work to overcoming that fear by understanding what really are you afraid of um, and then learning more about it. 
So knowledge can be a powerful tool to helping to kind of work through those fearful thoughts. And snakes, so Florida has 39 native snakes and they're, um, they're harmless, non-venomous snakes. And most of them are secretive and rarely seen by people. Um, we do have a few venomous snakes, but the risk of a venomous snake bite is very, very small. And so when you see a snake, you do want to leave it be. Um, so, you know, that goes with most of our animals that we witness in our natural areas or even in our backyards. You know, we don't really want to go trying to handle things that we're not familiar with or, you know, that's when people tend to get into trouble when we see the you know, alligator bites in the news and things like that. So, you know, leave it be approach is always best. With bugs, so there's millions of species of insects and bugs and many of them are food for animals. So for example, our birds, Carolina wrens, they exist almost exclusively on a diet of insects and they can really help to build that food web. Um, only a small percent, you know, can sting or bite humans or really cause harm to humans. So. A lot of them are going to be perfectly kind of benign, like for example, our butterflies, you know, there's no way for them to, to harm us. Um, some of the caterpillar form can be irritating moth, moth caterpillars and stuff, but um, typically, you know, our insects, they're going to be beneficial to our garden and again, provide the foundation for that food web. Taking a quick look at bears. So bears actually subsist on a diet that's 80% plants and 20% meat. The, the meat that they do eat is not going to be larger animals. You know, they're, um, Florida bears are smaller than, say, our northern grizzly bears or, you know, of course, polar bears, larger black bears. So our black bears are, are smaller and they're going to be feeding on, you know, smaller mammals like, in you know, squirrels and possums, uh, things like that. But they really do eat a lot of plants and they forage a lot they're going to be, unless they're enticed by human um, encouragement, like garbage, pet food, bird feeders, things like that, they're typically going to be very fearful of humans. And so we want to keep that fear in them. We don't want to have domesticate them in any way. We want to keep them in their natural habitats, foraging. And when they start to, you know, see humans as food, then you know, that's when the interactions can occur. And again, we see those, those news stories. So if you do encounter a bear, um, you know, let the bear just kind of go on its way. A lot of the times just some loud clapping will scare the bear away. And again, using those bear safe trash cans in our bear ordinance area, our Wakaiva Basin is really, really critical. And finally, all alligators, a lot of these principles apply to alligators. But again, not feeding alligators, um, it's, it's illegal, but it's also the right thing to do to make sure that we're keeping these animals wild and you know, never swim near alligators. So typically alligators are gonna be really um, kind of quiet and calm creatures. They're gonna be sunning themselves and um, really again, fearful of, of humans. Once they get a little larger or if they're mating, then you know, that can be a risk, but always, having a let it be approach is, is best with gators. So, you know, work through any, any thoughts you might have about having that reluctancy to experience our natural areas. Um, of course, you know, going with a friend is always a nice day to enjoy some of our wilderness areas and hikes. And you can see we have many um, available, again, the Black Bear Wilderness Area, Econ Wilderness, Lake Jessup, econ, you know, so just get out there and enjoy these. And then additionally, we have our parks. So these are going to be more manicured, managed areas, you know, our wilderness areas. Aside from fire, there's really not a lot of maintenance that occurs. When our parks, you know, you might see athletic fields or, you know, trash cans and things like that. So they're more actively managed. But we do have several parks that are throughout the area, some having tennis courts and camping and different things like that. So definitely check those out and integrate them into your healthy living lifestyle. Um, so here's, you know, just a, a trail picture. And again, you know, when we're out in nature, we're getting this nice dose of green. And as we were preparing this, this webinar, you know, just doing a little additional reading that the human eye can perceive so many different shades of green 
more than any other color. And it's just really fascinating how it does have a profound effect and calming effect on the body. And then, you know, here's just a few things that you might see when you're out there. So in the middle, we have, this is one of our native carnivorous plants. It's a sundew. They're only about the size of a quarter or silver dollar. They're not very big, um, but they are quite fascinating where you can see um, these little pads. That's where the insects land and they do use enzymes to digest and consume those, those insects. Um, we have, of course, amphibians, so lots of frogs. Uh, we have turtles and gopher tortoises, which are the opposite of turtles. So gopher tortoises are gonna be our land creatures and then turtles are gonna be aquatic creatures and tons of birds and um, just different wildlife that you can enjoy. And then we wanna cultivate that in our yard and landscape as well. So going out into nature, finding that inspiration, learning about native plants, learning about native ecosystems and integrating those principles into our yards and landscapes so we can really enjoy nature without leaving our home. Um, you know, so we're building that food web as our, you know, in our in our yards so that we can enjoy birds and, and their nesting habitats and, and feeding and things like that. So that all starts with right plant, right place. And we want to make sure that we are assessing our site conditions for the sun and the wetness of the site, the pH of the site all the different parameters to see, you know, what plant would really fit best. And we have a lot of great workshops and webinars on that. We wanna then water our plants efficiently. So, you know, we were just talking about the rain and the rain predictions and tuning into that so that you know if your plants need water and if they do using supplemental irrigation to assist them getting through those dry and drought periods, which really are, driest part of the year is typically April and May. So this rain is truly, um, you know, feeding our plants and nourishing them. And then fertilizing appropriate, like Katie said, we do a lot of fertilizer education because fertilizer can actually turn into pollution and, you know, healthy, healthy bodies, healthy lifestyle and healthy environment. We want to make sure that we're using that fertilizer appropriately for our plants so that they do take it up and not make you know not having it leach into our aquifer or run off into our surface waters um, as pollution and that's the nitrogen and phosphorus so if you are fertilizing select a slow release nitrogen fertilizer and um, you know try to definitely read the label and and try to do a soil test to see if you really need that fertilizer mulch mulching is great so um, you know really applying about a two to three layer of mulch two to three inch layer of mulch is going to benefit your soil. Attracting wildlife, so that's really kind of the foundation of what I was talking about before, to be able to use plants and insects to cultivate a really a, a food web and an ecosystem in your yard. Managing yard pests responsibly, so if we're trying to attract wildlife, we don't want to be doing routine pesticide applications um, and really minimizing our use of chemical pesticides to select you know, if we do want to identify those insects and then switch to horticultural oils and horticultural soaps to take care of any, you know, harm, harmful insects in our landscape. Recycling yard waste. So we do a lot on composting, but you can actually, you know, composting is great, but if you don't want to do it, you can also just simply reuse your leaves, reuse, you know, leave those grass clippings on the yard and um, just having a low maintenance approach to reusing that stuff in your landscape so that we can use that organic material back into the system. And then reducing stormwater runoff. So thinking about, you know, installing a rain barrel or, um, you know, maybe a rain garden so that you can prevent stormwater from going into our lakes, rivers, and streams. And then protecting the waterfront. So I always say that Florida Friendly is really a water quality and water quantity program in the landscaping disguise. And that's because we, we wanna protect our surface waters. And so if you live by the, the lake or if you live by a stormwater pond or have one in your neighborhood, definitely using the best practices to vegetate that shoreline is gonna be very helpful. So diving into these a little bit more, and I gave you a really good overview. So I'm gonna kind of run through these, but again, right plant, right place is really the cornerstone of Florida friendly landscaping. 
Um, we want to select plants for a specific site and have, um, you know, focus on your soil test, figuring out how much sun and shade you have over your landscape, looking at drainage. So when we do get a heavy rain like we did in Central Florida recently and, and maybe even later today, um, looking how it drains over the site and choosing low maintenance plants. So Florida friendly are always going to be a great selection that includes Florida native plants. And then watering efficiently. So some of the best practices for our watering early in the morning. So definitely before 10 a.m., but even as early as 6 a.m., you know, have that system go off if, if that is needed. Uh, the wind is calm and it's just going to be much more absorbable um, to your plants, less loss to that irrigation or evaporation uh, in the high, high noon times of the day. Uh, so definitely avoiding between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And again, remember 60% about is uh, about 60% of your water bill is going to irrigating your landscape. So we definitely want to conserve and calibrate our systems in the landscape so that we can uh, conserve that water for future generations. So we did just recently change to daylight savings time. So if you're um, operating an irrigation system from April through October, if you're an even numbered household, you'll be able to do Thursdays and Sundays, odd numbers, it'll be Wednesdays and Saturdays. Again, you can do it twice a week, but that doesn't mean you need to. So look for the curling of the leaves or um, you know, check that weather application or you know, work with your system app if you have that to be able to make sure that you're not overwatering. Fertilizing appropriately, so we never want to fertilize within, actually it's 15 feet of any water body, so apologies for the error in the slide there. Um, we never want to fertilize within uh, 24 hours of a rain event. So even though this is a good time, you know, according to our calendar below, March, April, and May are great times to fertilize. We never want to water, you know, right, like yesterday we got rain, today we're getting rain, tomorrow we're predicted to get rain. Now would not be a good um, time to fertilize. We never want to do it in conjunction with heavy rain events. So uh, we do have a restricted period, which runs June 1st through September 30th, where we're not um, allowed per the county fertilizer ordinance to use any fertilizer application of nitrogen or phosphorus. So always read that label. And we wanna select, actually this changed as well, the 65% slow release nitrogen um, product. 50% is typically what's commercially available, but if it is, you wanna select a 65% and always go with a no phosphorus. So again, phosphorus is one thing that's polluting our um, Wakaiva River. So we wanna make sure that we're not using phosphorus. And then you can see December, January, and February are kind of in orange. And that's because um, you can fertilize, but we don't recommend it on the University of Florida because um, research shows that that's when the plants in Central Florida are actually more dormant. They're not gonna be actively growing roots to uptake that fertilizer. The really best time to fertilize is that March, April, and May when it's not raining. Looking at mulch, so mulch is going to buffer soil temperature, inhibit weed growth, um, add that or important organic material to our soil, and we want to select byproduct mulches, so utility mulch or, you know, again, using your leaves to recycle that mulch and avoiding cypress mulch because it does come from our wonderful wetland cypress trees. Attracting wildlife. So again, recreating these ecosystems in our urban and suburban spaces. So we have here, you know, this is kind of our normal suburban sprawl. And as we grow in Central Florida and throughout our state, we are seeing a decrease in our wildlife and our, our wilderness areas. And so we want to, and even our agricultural spaces, which can be great habitat for, for animals. So we want to make sure that we're allowing for them in our landscape and not just really the, the uh, birds, but also the, the bees, the pollinators, even small mammals can be great for providing food for hawks and other types of animals. Again, managing yard pests responsibly. That starts with scouting and looking in your landscape, looking under the leaves to see if you have an outbreak starting and catching it early. Um, a lot of you know, this can be based on realistic expectations as well. You know, it's not really possible to have an insect free or weed free or disease free landscape. So we want to start with recalibrating our expectations that Florida is a 
subtropical, you know, we're subtropical here in central Florida and we want to say, okay, we're going to have some, you know, weeds and, and, you know, we're going to have that, that growth from all the heat and rain. So we want to work with that and bring in those beneficial insects by planting our wildflowers. And um, again, if you find an outbreak of insects, of problematic insects early, spot treating them with a horticultural oil or soap is going to be your best bet. Recycling yard waste. So again, composting is a great way to harness the energy, organic material, nutrients in your kitchen scraps, and also all of those, um, you know, uh, leaves and organic debris that we create in our yards and our landscapes. It can save money on fertilizer, mulch, and waste disposal. We want to create self-mulching areas. So you can see here we have some pine trees that when they drop their leaves or it could be oak trees or whatever type of tree, when they drop those leaves, it's going to be just really automatically putting that into the soil and creating not only a, a great system ecologically, but aesthetically looking really nice. And again, super easy if you just want to leave those get grass clippings on the lawn. That's an easy way to recycle that yard waste as well. And just remember, we all live in a watershed. So even if you don't live right next to the Wakaiba River, you know, everything that we do in our landscapes, all of the fertilizer and irrigation, it's all going to end up going either down into the aquifer as leaching or running off as stormwater runoff into our lakes, rivers, and streams. It might go to a stormwater pond first and then to the St. John's River. It might go to, um, you know, a low, directly to a local lake. You know, everybody's going to be a little bit different, but ultimately everything that happens in our watershed that is Seminole County affects our water bodies. So definitely keep that in mind as you're doing your, your yard work and, you know, see things around your neighborhood. And then finally, protecting the waterfront. So we definitely want that 15 foot no fertilizing zone around all of our water bodies and even really considering a buffer zone. So it can be a manicured buffer zone like pictured here or it can be a, a more wild, um, you know, elderberries and wild willows and things like that type of a, a buffer zone as well. So, you know, if you're going to go the wild route and just let it kind of grow, you want to consider, make sure there's no invasive species moving in. But that shoreline and that buffer zone is going to help to absorb any excess nutrients that might come up, come from, you know, our volatile organics or our, um, you know, fertilizers, our pet waste, uh, if somebody didn't pick up their pet poo and, and stuff like that. So all the different places that we get these nutrients, these plants are going to absorb it and really help to buffer that water and the protection. Because once it's in the water, it's extremely costly for the county to remediate. And so we definitely want to, to work with that. It also prevents erosion. So our, our, Soils are typically high in nitrogen or excuse me, phosphorus, and the phosphorus can become pollution. So we want to prevent that soil that's high in phosphorus from eroding into the area. And if you're working on the shoreline, definitely see if there's any permits needed. We do have a shoreline ordinance coming up soon that's going to be reviewed by our Board of County Commissioners and um, either pass and move forward in our county. We'll see, but um, our staff is working hard on that. And so we definitely want to be sure that we're obtaining any needed permits or approval in working in these areas. And finally, we have our uh, Florida Friendly Guide to Landscape Design and Plant Selection. And this is a great book. I'll chat it here in a minute so that you can use it to find plants that are great for your landscape. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Katie. So, uh... We did have a couple of questions. One was on pest control this time of year. So uh, because we had all that dry weather leading into this rainy season just now, um, or this rainy week, um, we did have ants starting to trail into houses in some places. So best pest control you can do for trailing ants that are coming inside from outdoors looking for water uh, is if you can figure out where they're coming in using caulk and getting rid of any holes that they're using to get into your house is number one. You can't figure out where they're getting in and they are a species that can be um, can be targeted with a broadcast bait. You could do a broadcast ant bait over your whole yard uh, and they should find that and take that back to their colony. It'll kill them. 
If they are not a species that those broadcast baits will work on, then using bait stations in your house and replacing them regularly and putting them near where the trails are actually found should uh, kill the ants within a week or so, depending on the bait that you're using. They take that bait back to their colony and feed it to the rest of the nest. Eventually it'll get to the queen. And once she's fed with that, there's no more ants. So there are a couple different options for that that are considered uh, best practices. Yeah, um, so I just um, chatted the Florida Friendly Guidebook. So check that out, that's a virtual version. Um, but it is the full book. And then I'm seeing somebody's asking about um, natural fertilizers. So we do, um, you know, anything that contains nitrogen and, and phosphorus is going to be um, a possible pollutant if it's not applied properly. You know, definitely working with a slow release. So that could be, you know, our compost, manures, those are all considered slow release as they're gonna break down over time. Um, if it's a quick release or a liquid nitrogen, that's going to be restricted during the summertime season. So um, just be sure you're checking out that label regardless of how it's branded because sometimes it can be a little confusing and you can always reach out to us for clarification. Okay. So going into our next section of uh, today's presentation, uh, we're going to be talking about incorporating edibles into your landscape. And first I wanted to start with the question of why should you incorporate edible plants in your landscape? We talked a little bit about this when we talked about the health benefits of gardening, uh, but why would you be interested in incorporating edible plants in your landscaping? So you can put that in the Q&A box. Um, and I'll go ahead and answer for myself, which is the reasons I'm interested in incorporating edible plants in my landscape. Are to attract wildlife. Um, I actually have a really big mulberry tree in my backyard and I really enjoy watching the birds going into the mulberries and eating them. And the tree, tree produces enough that both me and the birds uh, can eat the fruit off of it. So I see a lot of cat birds in mine right now. I've also had a lot of cardinals, uh, some tufted titmouses came a little while ago as well. So it's been fun to watch the birds and I like bird watching. I love my mulberry tree and I definitely encourage anybody who likes berries and also likes wildlife to, to get a cutting um, and plant it in your yard if you have the space. Uh, the waxlings have been on my tree just coming in a group picking all the ones that I can't reach at the top anyways. So it, I'm right there with you, Katie. Um, and we had an answer, which is a uh, part of our next, uh, next plot here, which is if you plant it and harvest it, you know it's been grown the way that you want it to be grown. So um, you know exactly what inputs you've put into this vegetable or fruit or herb because you're the one that grew it. So you, knew, you know what's in it and in your food. Uh, also, as I said earlier, you can't get any more local than your own backyard. So harvesting fruit from your own backyard is going to have you harvesting the freshest produce possible because you picked it that day. Uh, so it'll be full of nutrition and as ripe as it's going to get, uh, perfect ripeness because you're the one picking it. Uh, convenience is also a good reason. Yeah, I see that in our Q&A. So uh, being able to just walk out your back door and pick some herbs to use when you're cooking or I grow jalapeno peppers because I always seem to need just one jalapeno pepper for a recipe uh, and I don't want to have to go to the store and get one. So I grow peppers in my garden. Uh, also because it can be something that adds some beauty to your landscape though. Uh, you can see on our right side of the screen there with that espaliered tree, uh, which is a pruning technique that makes it have that right angled look to it. Uh, you can add some really interesting features to your garden by incorporating these edible plants. A lot of them are attractive to look at as well. One thing I would add too, Katie, is, is saving money. You know, this is a, a healthy living series. And when people fall on hard economic times, which a lot of people are right now with, with the pandemic, you know, um, saving money by growing food in your yard can be a great way, you know, so a little clamshell of blueberries at the store can be five bucks. And so if you can just go and shake your mulberry tree and get some, that's a, a lot of savings. 
Yeah, definitely. So some considerations you should take into consideration whenever you're deciding on what to grow is what do you like to eat? Um, I'm not a huge fan of tomatoes, so I don't usually grow tomatoes in my landscape. Uh, if you like tomatoes, you might want to grow tomatoes in your landscape as part of, uh, as part of what you're growing. Uh, where will you see the plant? So are you going to be looking out of your window and seeing this plant and knowing when you see it that it's time to harvest it? Uh, is it going to be off in the back corner where you have to physically remember to walk back there and look at it? Um, also consider texture and color and size and shape whenever you're picking your plants and figuring out where you're going to incorporate them into the landscape. So are they going to look nice in this uh, planting? And then also consider those nine Florida friendly landscape principles and consider is this the right plant for the right place? What kind of site conditions do you have? Is this going to be a really wet area, a really dry area? Are you going to get enough sun that those fruiting plants will actually produce fruit? All of these things are important whenever you're considering if you're going to incorporate edible plants into your landscape or not. Uh, yeah, we've got uh, one, one comment that I enjoy herbs uh, and like the convenience of fresh herbs just walking out the back porch. That's definitely a great reason to grow herbs. Uh, and then what kind of buffer do you need between your edible plants in the garden and grass that's getting regular maintenance with fertilizer and weeds? Generally with fertilizer, nutrients are nutrients to plants. So you don't really need to worry about the nutrients from your lawn fertilizer getting into your plants because it's all nutrients at the end of the day. For weed control, that's going to be on the package that the weed control product comes in. So it'll tell you how far away it needs to be from other ornamentals or edible plants, and you'll need to follow the label restrictions on that. Uh, when you're reading the label for both fertilizer and weed control and pesticide, the label is the law. So if you aren't following that label, um, you're probably not going to get in trouble, but you're not following the law. All right. So, oops. Pop forward to Tina. <laughs> All right. I'm not touching it. No, it's okay. Summertime, we're going to talk about summertime annual edibles. Um, these are things that you can incorporate into your landscape plan right now. They'll grow through the summertime. You can harvest and eat them. If you want to learn more about perennial crops or uh, trees or shrubs, then come to our Get Your Grove On classes that we're going to be teaching this summer and you can learn all about those. Um, we'll be doing a series of five or six classes on the different edible trees and shrubs that you can grow in your landscape. But for today, I'm just going to cover a couple of the ones that you can incorporate right now that are a quick annual crop. So first we've got sweet potatoes. Um, I just let sweet potatoes actually sprout on my counter that I bought from the supermarket and plant those right in the ground. You can also order sweet potato trip slips online. Uh, the new growth on these is really attractive. Uh, it's got a nice purple color to it and they grow really beautifully as a ground cover or spilling out of a container. If you want ease of harvest, planting them in a large container is probably your best bet. Otherwise you can incorporate these into your landscape. Uh, consider how you'll harvest them if you're going to incorporate them in the landscape though because this is mostly grown for their roots. So if you're harvesting sweet potatoes you do have to dig them up at some point. Uh, you can also though with sweet potatoes harvest the shoots and the leaves. So both the shoots and leaves are edible. Um, you can cook those up like you would any other green and they have a nice flavor to them. So while you're waiting for those roots to form over the summertime, you can still be harvesting the leaves and having a green plant from that to eat during the summertime. And they're very nutritious. So this might be obvious for some, but I'll just throw it out there that sweet potatoes are a completely different species than white potatoes. And white potato greens are not edible. Yeah, don't eat, don't eat russet potato leaves. <laughs> yeah. Or white, you know, red potatoes, good. any of those, you know, white potatoes. Next we've got okra. So you harvest okra fruit when it's young for the best fresh texture. Uh, young pods that are two to three inches long are going to be your best uh, flavored and tasting ones. And you can also plant spineless varieties. Okra fruit can have a little bit of a spine to it that can be irritating when it's not cooked. So if you go for spineless varieties, they're less irritating. In the landscape, you could use these in a flower garden as a backdrop plant. Okra plants can get quite tall. 
Um, you can use them as a specimen plant. They could be just a pretty shrub-like plant that you're growing in, in your landscape. Uh, you could also do a mass planting of them. They have really pretty yellow flowers and really kind of attractive looking large leaves. So they can be a really pretty texture in the garden. And they're actually in the mallow family. So they're related to hibiscus. Um, and I think they can make for a nice ornamental if incorporated into the landscape, particularly as a backdrop for some shorter plants. Next, we've got eggplant. And eggplant is something that I like to grow in my landscape because uh, fresh eggplant tastes much nicer and less bitter than what you're gonna find at the store usually. There are a lot of new varieties as well. You can see in the picture in the bottom right there, we've got orange eggplants and white eggplants and log eggplants and fat eggplants, uh, our typical purple, and then we've got lavender. So there are a lot of different varieties out there that you can choose from these days. Um, you're eating the fruit of these eggplants and they're ripe when the skin becomes glossy. So once the skin becomes dull again, then they're a little overripe. You wanna harvest whenever they're glossy. You can use these in the flower garden as a background plant, just like you would with the okra. Um, they can grow up to six feet tall, so these can get quite big. Uh, if you're gonna grow an eggplant that large, usually you need to do some kind of staking or trellising to help hold up the weight of the stems. They could also be a specimen plant. Again, these are pretty attractive. The fruit are big and beautiful. The leaves are pretty and fuzzy. Uh, they have these really cute little purple flowers. So they could be just an attractive specimen that you're showing off. Or again, you could do these as a mass planting, particularly as a mass planting at the back of the garden where they're a backdrop for other things. Next, we've got cow peas or southern peas. The white flowers of these are attractive. Um, on them, you can eat young pods when they're two to three inches long, just like you would a bean or green bean. You can eat the leaves, you can eat the flowers, and then you can let them grow until they're fully ripe and harvest the beans and cook those as dry beans. Uh, black eyed peas would be similar. They have uh, just typically one landscape use, which is climbing up a trellis, but you could train them again and the trellis to be a background plant for other things. You could have them going over an arbor. Um, there are a couple different ways that you could set these up, maybe over a teepee in the middle of the garden and make a cute little area for your kids to hide under. Um, and these are a great plant that can be grown in the summertime and that you can also harvest for greens whenever a lot of our uh, leafy greens are no longer available because it's too hot. Next, we've got peppers. So you can spice up your landscape with some peppers. Uh, the ripening fruit will add a little pop of color as they're growing. And again, we're eating uh, the fruit off of these. In the summertime, it's usually better to grow pepper varieties that produce smaller fruit. When you're growing something like a bell pepper and we're 90 degrees to 100 degrees out, uh, the temperature will actually cook the sidewall of that pepper before it's fully ripe. And so they can get a little funky. Whereas our smaller pepper varieties are gonna ripen quicker and so be able to har be harvested before they get burnt up by the sunlight. Uh, Landscape uses, you could do these guys in a container garden. Uh, they could be a little specimen plant uh, showing off in a container or at the edge of a bed, or you could do a mass planting of them where you have a lot of peppers all growing together. They can create a nice little green bush and then you get these colorful fruits kind of poking out as they ripen. Then finally, herbs are something that you can have year round. So this is our one perennial crop that I'll talk about today. And with herbs, we're eating the leaves, the roots, sometimes the stems. Uh, landscapes uses, they could be a backdrop in the garden, particularly lemongrass and rosemary can get tall enough that they could be a backdrop plant. They could also be mass planted so that you have a mass of uh, color and flavor. Uh, African blue basil is really great for that and is also a great pollinator plant. Uh, in the shade, you could go grow ginger or turmeric. And as a ground cover, Cuban oregano makes for a pretty good ground cover. Uh, it's something that we use in our herb garden here at the extension office. It does get about one to two feet tall, so it's a taller ground cover, but as a mass planting, it looks quite pretty. You're making me hungry, Katie. I know, it's lunchtime. <laughs> so uh, if you want a quick start for figuring out landscape design with edibles, uh, IFAS has produced a document that is all about landscape design with edibles. It's a pretty quick, small document. Uh, I've put up the link there. If you just go to Google and type it landscape design with edibles, though, it should pop up pretty quickly. And they had a couple of principles to keep in mind. 
So if you're wanting to incorporate these ed edibles into your landscape, you should go ahead and combine low maintenance ornamentals with your edible plants. So don't just grow all edibles, keep your hedge line that is uh, what Simpson stopper or wax myrtle, uh, but also incorporate some other plants in front of that hedge line or around that hedge line into your landscape beds that are edible. Use support structures that are also attractive, so trellises, arbors, teepees to hold up your plants, as opposed to something like a tomato cage, which is utilitarian and works really well, but may not be the most beautiful thing you can put in your landscape. Use containers. Uh, you want to choose one style of container or color of container to keep consistency. So if you go with all terracotta pots or all blue pots or all white pots, that's going to look more like you had a plan than if you just buy one of everything. Create hard edges on your beds to maintain a neat appearance. So whenever you have those bed lines, as opposed to just plants planted everywhere, it looks like you, again, did this on purpose. And doing things on purpose also can include using pathways, where again, it, it looks like you actually meant to create these beds, you have paths between them. Consider the texture, color, form, and size, and mix them for interest. There are a lot of different edible plants out there and a lot of ornamental plants. And when you combine them, you can get some really beautiful uh, decorative looking garden beds. Start small and select plants that you want to eat. So don't plant things that you don't want to eat. I'm not going to plant tomatoes in my landscape because I don't want to eat them. And then finally, we want to consider our irrigation and watering needs. Are you going to be out here watering these plants when they need it? Is there an irrigation system there? Or should you be choosing things that are a little bit more drought tolerant? And then finally, for our annual planting, consider cool season plantings too. So as these summertime veggies start to fade out because we're getting colder, you could start incorporating cool season veggies, uh, which include a lot of the leafy greens we can't grow in the summertime, like kale, which can have a beautiful texture to it, or the herbs like fennel, which are really soft and fern-like. Uh, so consider incorporating these things into your garden too as we start getting cooler uh, going into our winter. Uh, so how deep do your containers need to be for container edibles? It's going to depend on the plant. If you're growing something like an eggplant that gets quite big, I mean, an eggplant can get, like I said, up to six feet tall. You want a pretty big container for that if you don't want to have to water it all the time. Whereas something like a lettuce plant, you could probably grow in a smaller container. Uh... And are there UFIFA students looking for a blank Florida canvas? Uh, unfortunately, we're not tied into our UF students. So that would be something where you'd want to go through the University of Florida, maybe their landscape uh, design office to talk to you about that. All right. And all right, I'm turning it back over to you, Tina. All right. Great, so um, that pretty much wraps up our program. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A now um, so we can get those answered for you. We will be sending out a survey and um, some additional links and things that we provided today. Please do fill out that survey. It just takes a few minutes and um, you know it just helps us improve our programming and you know always try to you know, incorporate your ideas and thoughts. So just take a few minutes to check those boxes. And then we will send a follow-up survey in about three to six months. So it's not the same survey. It's actually a different survey. Just to see if you've been able to incorporate any of these, you know, behavior changes into your lifestyle. If you've been able to, you know, maybe do some of the wellness things that Sharon's talked about, or, you know, some of the natural areas type thing that I was talking about, or maybe some flora friendly principles or edible plants. So we'll follow up with you in, in about three to six months to see if you've been able to integrate anything. And so I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A. So we'll give you another minute just to see. And yeah, we'll be sending the slides and a link to the recording with that survey, so. You should feel guilty if you don't fill out your survey because you'll be getting those things from us. Yes, and everybody today is going to be getting a link to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to uh, Plant Selection. It's in the chat right now um, if you want to go there, but also we can definitely um, include that in the, in the follow-up email. Yeah. 
All right, great. Well, anything um, Sharon or Morgan wanted to add? Um, actually, I think Morgan. Uh, and we had one request that we add the link for the Florida friendly landscaping uh, plant stuff into the into the email when we send it out. Yes, absolutely. So we can definitely do that. Great. And then we also just wanted to mention uh, we have some farm tours going on. So it's actually virtual farm tour 2021 and it, it's occurring April 26th. So in about just under a week through May 16th. There's a blog about it already, and you can actually just use your um, QR code to check it out if you're not on your phone. Um, if you are, you can always just go to our Facebook page. There's a lot of information there as well. And this is going to be really kind of uh, cutting edge because usually our far farm tours are fairly exclusive. So it's a limited amount of people to be able to go to various farms throughout the county. And now anybody can participate by just going online. So our sustainable agriculture agent has done a fantastic job with incorporating this into a virtual experience and getting that promotion for our um, wonderful Seminole County farmers and uh, everybody who wants to eat local and, and embrace your uh, healthy Florida lifestyle. So check that out. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions, Katie. So I guess with that, we will close it out. But thank you everyone for joining us here on Zoom. And if anybody was watching on Facebook Live, we will be posting the recording as well to our YouTube page. So uh, multiple ways to access this information. All right, thanks for joining us, guys. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Take care.